people that to be credible, you have to have two qualities with those people that are your followers, your peers. First, you have to have expertise. Expertise is the first part of, tr of credibility. Now notice what that means for us as constituency managers. You see, we have to get across into their head enough information, phrases, jargon, just enough so that when they talk to their followers, it seems like they have expertise. If nothing else, the opinion leaders that we work with one-on-one -on -one have to be able to say to their people around the water cooler, well, I met with Joe Blow from Mountain Bell the other day and he told me. Because you see, that's expertise. I know something you don't know. The second thing is trustworthiness. You have to be trustworthy with that following. So if an organization or a person has both expertise and trustworthiness, they then have credibility. Now be careful, because when we make our opinion leader lists, lots of times we put those people with great expertise on it and nobody trusts them. Don't frog around with them, because they don't have any opinion leadership. We want folks that either have both, or if we have to settle for one, we'll take the trustworthiness and then we can give them the expertise. That's very important to remember as to who they are. The third point is, I think, is to not think, well, I, I guess I'll, I'll phrase it this way. They are not official. In other words, because somebody is elected to office or has a title, that does not make them an opinion leader. I mean, what do you think of your boss? Don't say it now. But that doesn't make them opinion leaders, does it? Of course not. There's an informal network of the real opinion leaders. And that's why very often in society, the folks really making the decision are buried down there somewhere where we don't see them. But boy, they have a following, they have credibility, and those are the ones we need to reach down in and find. And you, they're not going to have their name in the paper every day. You know, the best example of this that I know is to infiltrate the political parties. Because have you ever, has it ever dawned on you how those, those jerks get to be the leaders? You know, you look at them and you say, my George, they massacre the English language, you know, they got a, their socks on wrong, uh, they wear shirts like certain people at Mountain Bell. I mean, you know, and you say, how come? And yet, if you go through the organization, by George, they're leaders because they deserve to be leaders. Because the mass of humans out there trust them and believe that they have some political expertise. Those are the ones that we need to find. It's not difficult, it's not easy, it's not falling off a log by any means, but it's not awfully difficult either. The problem is that we let ourselves be fooled into thinking that publicity or notoriety is opinion leadership, and it, it isn't always. Sometimes it is. And on certain issues, people who have a lot of notoriety have to be dealt with just because they have the ability in the first step of two-step flow here they have the ability to get people aware, even of their dumb ideas. So people have to process them. Then we have to treat them as opinion leaders. But the ones we really want are the ones that have a following, that have credibility, and may or may not be official. People have differing ways of responding, and we need to be aware of that. In fact, the scholars tell us that there are sort of five speeds with which people respond. <clears throat> and we need to have an understanding of our society and how it's structured, and this is one way of understanding that. The first group are called innovators, and the innovators are quick responders, and frankly, if the bullet theory is still alive, it's alive with them. They find out about something new and bingo, they go do it right now. They don't need peer reinforcement at all. The only trouble is, on most issues, that's about 2% of the public. About 2% of the public are apt to be innovators. <clears throat> There's also a problem with innovators, and that is if you ask yourself, why do people always want to be first? Why do they want to be innovators? Psychologically, often it's because of ego. I was first. Well, you know, dealing with those kind of folks is very difficult. So they're not really much used to us in managing issues. Furthermore, by the time we get them nailed down and thinking about our issue, 
they're probably already jumped to some other new issue that they're innovating. So the innovators we kind of tend to stay away from, literally stay away from, because they're dangerous. They're dangerous to us. There's a second group, however, called early adopters. <clears throat> now the early adopters, those are the ones that we want to get to. They're not innovators. They're not going to just jump in without checking it out with their peers. But once they do jump in, they are the ones who then become the opinion leaders for all the rest. The early adopters, interestingly, and this is a very interesting fact of American society, the psychological motivation of early adopters is fear of embarrassment. Now, if you think about that for a minute, in our society, you don't get to be a leader, you see, unless everybody respects you. And if you're embarrassed a lot by making wrong decisions, people don't respect you anymore. I mean, after all, how do you get elected to office or get to be a, a major executive in a corporation? Not by being a freebooter, a freelance, but rather by reflecting the opinions and values of the people that you work with, of your constituents. So these early adopters are the ones who are reflecting what's happening, and yet they do it rapidly. Basically, they watch the innovators, and once the innovators have done it, it's okay for them to do. You know, <clears throat> when they show up at the garden party wearing their Nehru jacket, and everybody says, where did you get that thing? They say, Joe had one first. As long as Joe had one first, it's okay, because they're not really embarrassed by it. The third group is called early majority. <clears throat> and they're just about what they sound like. They're kind of speedy, uh, not really fast, but they move along. Um, they're the salt of the earth types, uh, the real hardcore of every community. But they want to be darn sure it's OK before they do it. And so they want these two groups to pioneer the way. And frankly, they probably sit around. And when these people do it, they say, look at that. Isn't that terrible? And then when these people do it, they say, well, I'm getting a little bit used to the idea. And after all, Joe's doing it. And finally, they say, OK, I'll do it. Following them is Dickie Nixon's famous silent majority. And interestingly enough, these two groups together usually make up about 80% of the American people. 80% of the American people. <clears throat> the silent majority is basically Joe and Jane six-pack. They've got a cold Coors in this hand and a channel flipper in this hand, and please do not bug them. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> they know what they're doing, they have their own agenda, and they can't be bothered with your issue. You know, D-Reg is nice, and they'll hear about it, and they'll learn about it, but getting them to behave in a certain way, or not to behave, that's a challenge, because the political scientists tell us you can rile this group up about once a decade. <laughs> They've seen too many years go by where the issues come up, the issues go down, a new issue comes up. They can't be bothered with all that. They just want a nice, level, happy life that runs in a straight line through all that. So while they're not going to do much unless we really can get them riled up, we need to understand their basic value system and never, never lose sight of it. Because if we lose sight of it, we might get them riled up. And believe me, nothing is worth that. The fifth group are called laggards. Now those laggards, those kind, are very valuable because they, they still believe that it's okay to have organizations run on private enterprise competitive principles. They still believe that you can trust other people, that you can trust other organizations, that you don't have to be you know, suspicious of everything that's happening. And those folks, those true laggards, if we can get to them, they can also be very valuable to us. On any topic that comes before the public, there's good evidence that about 5% of the people are automatically for it, and another 5% of the people are automatically against it. <clears throat> we call those people zealots. You know them. Their minds are made up. They don't care about the facts, but they don't care about opinion leadership either. They're just, there they are. Some of them are laggards, some of them are innovators, but there they are. They're just stuck. 
Then there are about 40% who are kind of leaning favorable or leaning unfavorable. <clears throat> but that's Joe and Jane, the silent majority. They have opinions. If you run out and do an opinion poll, they'll tell you what they think. And that's a real danger today in using opinion polls. In our professional practice, we don't use old-fashioned, simple opinion polls anymore. We go far beyond that in our research because Americans lie like mad on opinion polls. They really do. Okay, so these people have opinions, but they aren't going to act on their opinions. And that's what Phil Leslie is telling us, that in the middle, on almost every issue, there are about 10% of the people. Those 10% are probably early adopters. Maybe some of them are these other kind of laggards. A few early majority people, they have somewhat open minds. They care about the issue. They're not Joe and Jane on this issue. <clears throat> and they are the ones who are going to make the decision. And their opinion is going to be respected by these people here. So the thing we need to know, there's two questions we need to know. One is, who is apt to behave, to act, to do something on the issue? And while it isn't that we want to just forget the rest, the fact is we probably don't have the time, the money, or even the ability to get them to do much. The best we can hope for is to keep them informed and to let them do nothing. Trust us. Ah, and then there's the 10%. Who are these 10%? The opinion leaders. And how could we get to them and get them either to do something or to give their consent for us, for Mountain Bell, to do something and they will reinforce what it is we're doing. We have to present ourselves to the audience, whether it be an individual, a group, or whatever. So we've got a, a little over half an hour to talk about presentation skills. I want to start by making some observations about where you are. After all, we've got to do an environmental scan. And the environmental scan of this program, as we heard this morning, is that you've already been there a couple of times. And so there's some baggage floating around out there with some of the key contacts. I think most of you identified it as the fact that some of people who have remained key contacts and who still are such key contacts that you probably have to keep them on your list probably run when they see you coming because they assume Mountain Bell wants something from them. At least that's what I heard you saying. With those folks, we're going to need a re-entry. We're going to need to get to them and let them know it, it's a different ball game now. That now we want to know what they think more than we want to tell them what we think. Of course, there's a lot of folks who may be in that position of having been in these other programs that really shouldn't be on your list anymore. If you apply these new, tighter targeting rules that we've been talking about, have they got a following? Are they really opinion leaders? Are they action-oriented people apt to behave on their beliefs? So clearly, one of the first steps is going to be to redo those opinion leader lists, and some of those folks will fall off. What we need to consider <clears throat> before we even talk about the presentation of our material, whether it be an outbound message we want to send them or some input we want to elicit, is the whole business of how do we present ourselves at their doors. Consultants talk about making entry with a client. And what that means is that you get yourself invited in or you weasel yourself an invitation so that they, they want to have some kind of a dialogue or a relationship with you. Once you have made that kind of entry, then you move on to a step called contract. Now, I'm going to put that in quotes because obviously you don't sign a contract and a consultant doesn't sign a contract then. But in the contracting stage, you agree on what your relationship is going to be all about. All right, let's apply those now to constituency relationships. We need to learn how to make this approach, this entry. And we need to think, what's on their minds? I mean, I call them up and I say, gee, Mary, you know, you're uh, such a well-respected leader in the senior citizens uh, groups here in town.